Hey, it's the last Pacifier D Fanatic upset and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another episode of Reflections and my guest for this one is going to be Upset, who is currently a player of Fnatic, but obviously has been in many other teams over the years. Right, to start this interview out, right, one of the things I find a bit weird about League of Legends is until recently, I mean, let's be real, even recently, not everyone watches the RLs, but at least people like pretend to care about the RLs and the level below the LEC slash EU LCS, etc. But I'll be real, if, if someone's like a new school fan, nobody cared about that shit until a few years ago. Nobody. Like, if people don't know, actually, part of why, actually, the name Mad Lions and some of the players who came along as rookies that were a big deal is because that was one of the first DRL teams anyone cared about before that it was more like either there's a player coming up who you know is going to be good and you're just waiting like does he qualify or does he get picked up like Febbervern and people like that back in the day or it was like this player is in the second tier because he isn't good enough for tier one and then no one knows if he'll ever be a pro so what I want to ask is this right I don't actually know usually people's stories before they get to EU LCS because most of the time like I say it was really only like the real nerds who were following that stuff so I want to ask this right I know you came up through the challenger scene when it was actually the challenger scene before we had all the fucking IRLs and this whole system we got now and you were coming up and you were a player actually who at this time you you were in that category like I'm describing of people saying like this could be like a top player one day or someone with potential right how do you actually view your own sort of like rise to the LEC level that like status of like being in the top teams and getting to play professionally like how did you think of it like when you were a young player are you just someone who's just good at the game do you actually did you always have a, an ambition a drive to be a pro did you have did you actually think you were a top player how, how was your mind space back before you got into that level and you were just you were just at the point where we maybe could have heard of you mm, i yeah i always wanted to be a pro to be honest i my oldest brother started playing league and he we were watching like the competitive games already in season one when i was like 10 <laughs> 10 years old like moscow five even i watched so much league in my life uh, like from did you actually know what was going on if you were 10 years old though did you like did you actually like have a basic sense of like what they were doing yeah i was like bronze when i was 10. oh fair enough okay that's not bad not bad <laughs> it wasn't so bad back then okay. it was like 1300 yeah. points or something uh yeah so i i definitely knew i wanted to be a pro but it wasn't like i instantly was super good obviously but once i was like challenger or high diamond in season four and then challenge uh, afterwards i definitely knew i was on the right path because i was still really young and i i'm just a really driven person with a very strong will for what i want and i really wanted this so i just tried yeah just super hard to to make it as a pro i would say uh, and i was always very confident or maybe cocky or whatever so i always thought i was very very good and um yeah it started with me playing in challenger series actually in season six i think but it was like i was still at home i was actually playing with caps i was playing so much to he was caps when i was younger like 15 16 we were playing like very semi -pro. how old is he like 13 or something he must be pretty young at this time right yeah we, we, we he's actually older than me so oh is he holy yeah. moly right <laughs> Wasn't aware uh, of that. Fair enough. It was me, Noskarin, and Tim, and Dan. Some people maybe remember him. Or, but mainly me, Noskarin, and Caps were playing like so much Dynamic Q, and we were playing a lot of Duo Q uh, when we were like, yeah, super young. And then we played Challenger Series together, but we were still all at home, and it didn't work out. Like pe maybe people remember like the like way back Caps playing like Vladimir versus Azi and just getting out of attack to death and he died but yeah uh, probably not many people remember because it was like so long ago but then i made the next season was when he joined Fnatic, and i also had an offer to go lec this was season seven i just turned 17 i think or maybe yes. i was still 16 but the next year i would turn 17 for season seven um but i decided i actually was in a L in a team but i didn't sign a contract yet which was giants back then which was in lcs still uh, and I actually even played a tournament with them, but I didn't sign the contract yet. And I got approached by a different team who made a much more compelling offer because it was like Vanda, uh, Selfie was in the time like not bad. Lulex played in LEC, Smithy J. I don't remember if he played in LEC, uh, but Vanda just came off top four at Worlds, and my support in Giants would have been Hustlin. And Vanda just played like was forgiven and. Uh, it was like this crazy project that I thought for sure we would make it to LEC <laughs> in summer split. And yeah, I was really 
really hyped for that project, but I could have also went uh, LCS when I was just about to turn 17. Okay. Right, one thing I want to ask about, it's it's going to be a theme in this interview, I think, so that would be an interesting way to talk about your career, is there are certain roles in the game that I think of, and I just think, like, there's a bazillion people you can think of play that role, like, you think there's all different ways to play, like, mid lane and top lane, people kind of know roughly how that's played, etc. It's in history, there's a lot of similarities, but I actually think ADC is a bit interesting for me, in the sense that, like, because I came into the game around, like, season two, season three, people don't know, ADC was busted as fuck in season two, like, that was when the, the joke was, like you'd have people just play like Cogmore and just have like the most damage in the whole game and look like all people but it clearly wasn't that like the players were all the absolute best just the role was super strong right then you had later seasons where like obviously if you go to the time period where like season 8 maybe it's, I mean eventually it became not at all about ADC it was about the solo lanes and in fact you could even say some of that carries on to this day like mid and top again incredibly powerful positions so what I want to ask you is this normally when you ask players in any esports game right oh did you have any like heroes or whatever the problem is they take the hero part and go to far with it where they think that like if they credit that guy especially if it's someone that they later knew or played with or against they feel like they're like giving up too much by admitting they thought that guy was good what I want to ask you basically was this since you played ADC as a role how did you actually think of that as a as a role in the team because I've noticed in Europe in particular it feels to me like in European League of Legends they do tend if you can have a carry meta top to put a lot of the ADCs more as like the t- third carry or like you're more about like just stay there like it doesn't feel like the forgivens and the easy eyes of the world it doesn't really feel like that's as much like the european style of league of legends but people would probably say over your career you've maybe shown like an affinity mentally to that style so how, how did you envision ad carry like what do you think this role like could, did you think for example you could be the star player of your team you could be the best player yeah i, I always thought that uh, in nearly every team i played and i thought i was the best player and i it but even if i think i'm the best player i usually want the game to be played around my mid laner because I've made experience so many times that uh, we stomp bot a lot, we do well in scrims with this and then we go on stage and they play the game more strategically and they don't give as much on bot and they go through mid and they pressure mid a lot and then the game is just very hard if you can't connect with your mid laner the enemy mid laner has a lot of pressure and he can move a lot um, but I mean, we have to look at all the different teams where I thought I should definitely carry and where it made sense. And also, depending on the support players I played with. But overall, it's very meta-dependent what the AD carry role is supposed to do. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a carry role. It's AD carry. So I think most of the time you're supposed to have a lot of resources and uh, try to carry the game. Sure. Right, one thing I actually wanted to ask her was this. In the modern day as well, it's a point I made a couple of years ago on Summoning Insight, and I don't think people thought it through, is that because the game length literally changed in League, like games became a lot quicker, and you don't get like 50-minute games like you used to, even the terminology we all have of like late game, early game, we had to change that because the joke is late game now is like 35 minutes or something. Like That used to be like the end of the mid game at certain times that you could say like 20 to 30 was the mid game when it was the really old, slow vision meta. So I want to ask you this, right? Back in the days before... Before we got to this newer game where the game is a lot quicker one of the things I want to ask about was wasn't ADC kind of more and part for me of why it was more easily defined is there was a late game to get to and so if you're in the ADC like you kind of know like right that's my time to shine right yeah I think the game up to season 8 was was a lot like in season 8 at the end of season 8 there was like a or in between spring and summer there was like this huge change and I think after this league was never completely the same i think they changed a lot with the items and how much gold you can get and how strong solo lane champs are and how many plays they can make even early on um yeah the role definitely changed a lot with that and i think with plates and how important dragons are and everything you definitely don't see the super late game point reached anymore or champs like this are like super strong unless they are also strong in the early game which sometimes happens of course but uh, yeah, definitely. I think the role is much more also about early game now. 
So the interesting thing is, I actually think I know like, the genesis of what this interesting storyline we're going to talk about now is where a lot of people might not, which is, if people might not know, when you first came to the LEC, obviously it was EULCS at the time, the actual like sort of framing that people were putting around you as a player was like, this could be the next Forgiven. And you obviously had leaned in it yourself. Now, it's worth understanding if people don't know, that's because right before you joined the EULCS, your coach was veteran and he was one of the people who set some of these narratives, etc. And so I remember at the time, if people don't know, obviously he'd worked with Forgiven he thought Forgiven was better he thought Reckless Sister was a bit overrated we were sort of aligned on that one and basically he sort of set this framing of sort of like and I, t- I didn't necessarily take that by the way as like the style's going to be the same I took that as sort of the mentality of like this is going to be like a true carry AD carry it's going to be the best player and we're not going to play a sort of reckless style which I would judge as like sometimes you, basically let's be real like they only play like purely through reckless when the team breaks like other than that you try to have an amazing set of solo laners and just have a complete team I always thought it was so overrated making it like a one man team for him so what do you think on this because the interesting thing to me is I'm sure a lot of people will obviously get to some of this later in the interview would probably say actually that they would say your modern day style is more comparable to reckless maybe than a forgiven as it were so what would you say to that like did you agree with the sort of framing were you trying to be that kind of AD carry back then what would you what would you say to this topic um, well, I definitely think the teams I was in basically since the start of my career, maybe bearing one or two exceptions, the teams were mostly built around me to carry. And I think I was the best player or the most consistently performing well player. And I definitely also liked to, I mean, my play style was definitely a lot around gaining advantages and setting up good situations for my team to me ahead because that's also something that's really important like of course you can win trades 2v2 really well but i think i've always been quite good at talking with my support and jungle outside of the game and explaining situations how i see them and how we can set up plays that are successful and what we need to do once we get this and i definitely want my jungle to do a lot of things if i have pressure with my pressure and utilize that and through that, of course, you are kind of carrying the game because you are the pressure point and everything goes to you. You help people uh, make plays, invade enemy jungle, dive the enemy bot laner, set up ganks where people get gold, take dragons. Uh, so, yeah, I, I definitely think my mindset overall is I try to make the most out of the situation I have. And if I can get a matchup where I know I can win lane and really dominate the game, I definitely want to have that matchup and pick my champ first and try to do my best uh, to do that. I want that responsibility. Obviously, like you said earlier, I'm sure how you play and your philosophy at a given moment is based also on who your teammates are, like who your support is. Is it Roman support? Is it lane support? What year is it? What meta? But a question I had was this. So one of the things that I know Pete often confuses people is why, like, for example, I could like Frogger as a mid laner, but then not like Reckless as AD carry, because in their view, it's like, it's doing the same thing. You're just farming and being boring. And it's like, but the problem is it's the role to me that makes it so different. Like to me, the difference is this. In theory, right, if a mid laner as long as they're not literally under their tower, which by the way, if they're under their tower, they're not getting all the CS. If they just actually are winning in CS, I don't think they actually have to necessarily a lot of the time go for kills. I think they can just keep the mid lane push. They can, obviously there's a million things they can do with their team and they're ahead and they're one of the most powerful roles in the game. Now, I don't hate that as an AD carry. Like if you're telling a low elo player who doesn't know the game much, that's the first thing you tell them is tell them, stop fucking fighting, just CS properly and try and out CS the other guy and in the long run, you'll get better items, you'll get to the fights, you'll win the game. So the problem is, I do agree that's like a decent baseline way for AD carries to play. But I guess the point I'm getting to is this. I think even though most Diddy carries probably should just play it more towards the farm style, the difference is, though, because it's a duo lane and in the modern day, you've got like T- you used to have TP and you had the jungler could come. It's just the possibility to create kills is enormous, though. So my question to you is this. Philosophically, we could talk about any period of time you want in the game here. Do you have, like, a preference? Would you rather be the guy who, like, would you rather just not risk anything and just get way up in CS and the CS turns into gold and then you've got the items? Is it be- is it actually good, do you think, to people who like to fight all the time in the bot lane? Obviously, different sports you've had would have different perspective, I'm sure. What's your take on that? Like, which do you think is the best for an, an ADC? Mm, well, in theory, the best way to play is the way where you have least amount of risk to lose the game where it's like the most sure that you're gonna win the game but usually that is like very rare that you get matchups like this where you don't have to fight and where you can't where you can just slowly win the game without taking any risks or i i think if you there's like good place and bad place and of course some place you need to take more risk but usually it's like 
very clear like what kind of risks you should be taking that are reasonable and what kind of risk are putting the game the win of the game more at risk than you gain value from uh if i can put myself clearly uh so i i think it's more like a very balanced line that you have to see but some games you need to take risks i think that you usually wouldn't do it it depends on so many different factors as well um so yeah i'm definitely not risk averse in the champs i choose or how i want to play but i'm also not somebody who wants to make the game solely depend on like not so great percentage plays because i want to be like the aggressive guy who has to carry the game or lose the game for steam that's not me at all i usually try to provide very consistently good value to my team and they know what i can expect and uh, i'm definitely not the player that goes for the super risky plays i think i i'm more on the consistently winning side of plays i think the first notable and indeed good lineup that people might remember that you were in was obviously the one that went to the EULCS finals, the Schalke team with mm -hmm. Nuke Dork and Vizicacci and Amazing and Vanda. Now, these are all obviously mega veteran names around you in this team and all people who are super experienced, like MVPs, people who've been to finals before, right? Even though when I did my interview with Nuke Dork, he actually thought, because I said to him, I thought they were, that team was a bit hard done by, like obviously he almost made it to Worlds. He actually said that because of the meta at the time, he doesn't think he would have done well at Worlds. But this team, when you look back now, mate, on paper, that lineup, fucking banging it was pretty good at the time but it's pretty good now too if you look at it like if you're coming into like a higher level of play it must be great to play with loads of veterans like that uh yeah that's definitely one of my more fond memories of a team because it actually felt like we were really a team and it came out of the really difficult spring split where we still had pride stalker uh, and this is a amazing example how league of legends meta changes can really change a lot in how the offseason went for you because we got like we were playing a lot of in-houses and pride stalker was like winning every single game i've heard he's like a scrim god people said even to this day is partly yeah. yeah yeah he was he was <laughs> he was like ranga was meta he was he used to be ranga one trick right zin Zhao, and something i think one more of these champs uh, maybe was it evelyn I, i'm not sure like so, some some assassin champs and then they made a huge patch for season eight and it was suddenly only tanks it was sejuani zach and uh, I think Trande maybe, or like just really tank heavy. And we in our team tried to make him play tank. So our coach was very pushing towards that. And I mean, it was the meta, right? It was like for sure the best way to play, but um, we really struggled that split. And I actually was pretty sick for the first three weeks before the split started. And I even missed, I think, the first game of LEC because I was just super sick and I couldn't play solo queue so I think the expectations were very high for me and I had super high expectations for myself because in the boot camp with this team with this lineup we actually went like I don't know 18 and 2 in scrims or something like that and then uh, it went to a, was was a very big struggle for me this split because I couldn't practice for so long like I said and we were like going 1-1 one, one every week or sometimes 0-2 and we ended up missing the playoffs by one game I'm pretty sure and it was like a very yeah difficult time for me to find my ground and how I want to play when I felt like kind of rusty or not so in shape how I imagined it to be when I joined LEC because of the circumstances yeah yes what did you think then of the team when it actually got the good players um yeah, I, we we basically only swapped jungle right for amazing, but it changed a lot in our team because what was Milo's weakness in terms of like let's say some leadership or just taking responsibility for your own decisions in the game and making them based around your teammates more than around yourself, which is obviously super necessary when it's a tank matter. Um, this was amazing's big strength at the time. Of course, he was not like at his peak anymore, but. He brought a lot in terms of that, I would say, and he, we also find like our identity very clearly and we had a pretty good meta read. At first, in this split, the meta actually completely changed, if you remember, because AD carries were completely gone. It was gone. the funnel period, yeah. yeah. And um, I look fondly also at Nuke in this time when everything changed. Like It was not just funnel, it was also Vladimir, Rice, uh, sure. Botlane and Victor and the stuff, and he taught me a lot actually he was super good at playing oh he helped friend. you with the mages right yeah and i think i was actually very good on these mages and then you were, what, you were one of the rare adcs like real adcs that played them right yeah i think so i mean some people 
I mean, there were like, for example, Fnatic, I think, even changed Whippo, right? Which was yes. also really yes. strong. Yes, Reckless wedged himself, yeah. Some people kept playing AD carries. I think Hans was still playing a lot of ADs, but uh, I felt really good in this because I, yeah, I I used to play mid lane for like the first three seasons, uh, three seasons, and I really enjoyed that playstyle too. And yeah, it was really cool. Um, and about the solo lanes, I guess. Nuke was definitely the one that gave this team a lot of identity, but we still mostly played through bot lane, especially when the meta swapped back to AD carries. But he was somebody who really gave the team like the style, because it was like when he was playing 8 million champions and he was playing Zed a lot in that split and Yasuo, and he really... This was, I think, the best version of Nuke I ever played with, and it was really... Yeah, it was a really cool experience. Yeah, yeah, I think actually, if people don't know, that season was sort of like a renaissance for him where he got back to being a top player. He, was, he probably was the only guy aside from Caps who was like the best. It was him, Caps and Perks, basically. The question I had is this. Obviously, later you played with him again in, uh, in uh, OG in Origin, mm -hmm. right? One of the things I found interesting is this, is actual analysts of the game all seem to think Nuke Duck is overrated, by the way. They all think that like he doesn't truly deserve like the elite status or like there's a reason he didn't win or whatever, you know. So what I want to ask you is this. I noticed that a lot of the players who played with him, though, all hold him in like way higher regard than some other analysts. So aside from, look, this was actually a very good split for him. But in general, what, what do you think the qualities of Nuke Duck that he brings to a team that maybe people don't see just in the server as a observer? What do you think? What do you think? Make, why do you think he's held in such high regard or why do you hold him in high regard? Mm. Well, for me, he was kind of the person I talked with the most. I think even season seven, we, we were in a group of friends and he was, we played so much uh, games together. And he, I think the things that I really liked about him was he had a very good work ethic, especially back then or before. I think he was rank one, like for a lot of seasons in a row. And he was really trying to play so much. I think he's very intelligent about picking up information from watching other teams or other leagues. He also has like a good way of thinking critically about what champs he should play and how the game should be played. And he brings a lot in that regard to a team, I think. Um, also, he plays usually really good in scrims. I think he tries really hard and he makes good calls. Uh, so yeah, I, not much more you would want from your teammate, I think. Um, Super, super good strategic mind as well, I think. Sure. So here's the question I have, right, which is, because in the next teams we talk about, it's going to come into eventually blurring into that whole topic of like, is the whole team upset trying to 1v9? Oh, does he demand all the results? You know, that whole fucking thing people think's like, essentially, like, they do think you are double lifting fucking forgiven and do the times 1 million plus entitlement plus German or something like, that's like the equation. <laughs> so well, to, to get into that, though, we have to now start talking, obviously, about the time when you went back to Schalke, but this is when they're actually an LEC team, obviously. Mm -hmm. So these were the teams where I noticed that, like, narrative started to get set, right? So my question is, first of all, right, when you were initially in that team, you actually had the same thing happen. You had the bloody, like, jungler swap out changed everything so you started out if you remember in Schalke you had Memento and this was one of those weird scenarios where like the first part of the split was going great and then actually like the team was looking like he was actually looking like he was doing a good job but then something went wrong he fell apart and it obviously had the summer swap and he got trick in the lineup etc when you came to these Schalke teams right is it not did it not feel mentally like a, a step down to go from being in like the LEC finals play with all these super veterans like good mid lane and like then you have to go and start playing again with like look some of these people are good players like if you look back now the rosters aren't bad on paper but at the time these were other people who like they either they'd been like kicked out of a team or they didn't get the picked up to the top squad these are kind of like the leftover pieces does it not feel like a bomber to go from like your first split you hit nearly the top and then you have to go back down a level yes after season eight actually everyone wanted to leave the team because the organization wasn't able to be too competitive with other makes sense members. sure and I was actually in the process of being bought out by multiple teams and even the... Didn't you tell me once, like, for real, it could have been G2? Like, you could have actually just been in G2? I'm guessing yeah, if Caps didn't join, right? Well, uh, at the timeline was more that I was first and I couldn't be sold. And then, right. And then Caps was after how I understand it. And, um, yeah, that was, of course, very heartbreaking, to be honest. Sure. Because, uh I mean, especially after seeing what they have accomplished in these years, but in my mind, I, I, I always have this feeling in me that I, I would have done very, very well as well. 
because if I would have been part of this 2019 team, sure, and it would have been really epic also to have Caps still in a different team and see that play out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, like getting Caps to your team and taking him from the next best team uh, made more sense in the end. But it was was not really up to me, so I was in a difficult spot. That sounds it makes it even worse then, dude. Because I'm saying it just purely from like the, what obviously happened in like what we know happened, which team you it sounds even worse if you have your first ever year in LEC and then by the summer you're in the finals, like you're this close to going to worlds, you play with all these great players, then you get an offer like, oh, you might be able to come and we'll make like a super team of all the greatest players. Oh, sorry, no, that's not happening now. You have to just go and join Schalke again. Like, see ya. Like, that sounds yeah. brutal. Yeah, it was very <laughs> brutal because also I really felt. Uh, close to perks in a way like as someone i would really love to play with because right. I think he had a lot of the leadership skills that i would love to have learned sure. from. because i was at msi with him before i when i was in challenger series in between spring and summer you I listed was, as a sub right yeah, yeah but i was like in brazil with them and i would consider right. myself good friends with perks and he i really loved how he was approaching things and i think if i could have had him as part of my support structure i really could have developed a lot faster and in a more in a very positive way not through pain but through <laughs> success <laughs> but yeah this 2019 lineup i think looking back at it now actually this roster looks really sick yeah. for me looks because great now doesn't it yeah <laughs> because Odo Amne is like was probably the best top laner last split if i mean wonder of course was also really good but let's like if i don't think about my team or yeah, it was super good um all pro has had such a great resurgence for him. I think he's somebody who has always worked really hard, and I, I, don't necessarily see myself in him because I think we are so different uh, personality-wise. But I definitely really respect his effort to keep trying his best, and he's always someone who puts in so much effort to come back to it, even though maybe we had our differences playing together. But he was somebody who just got kicked out of Splice, I think, for yes. my top laner for Vizichachi <laughs> that I played with the last year. Um, I, I think he was in a tough spot because it was also late in the season and we managed to pick him up. And then support I had Igna, who was for me a very wildcard thing to get because, well, we didn't see him play for a year at this time, I think. He, it was not like he just came out of Misfits. Maybe it was after... BBQ? I think it was after BBQ. Yeah, I think that's right. Yes, yes, that's right. It was, yes. After him and Trick were in BBQ, yeah. But he actually turned out to be, like, yeah, definitely one of my favorite supports I ever played with as well. He, was he actually, as a player, like he appeared? Because if people don't know, when he went to NA, I saw, like, he would, like, banter flame people in his bloody career. And, like, if you look at his playing style, he does just look like like he just decides, like, yeah, I'm off. He's just going off and just making a fucking play in the middle of nowhere. Like, was he, is he really like that as a teammate? Um... No, I would say Hilly is much more like that. Right, okay. <laughs> but he also has tendencies. I think Hilly is like the more extreme version of Igna. But uh, I think I've developed like more of a, the closest relationships in my teams have most of the time probably been with my supports. And usually we always got a good understanding of like, ah, this guy sometimes ins it pretty hard when he gets ahead. Maybe he just, maybe just... Stay bot, you know, like, we let's see what we can do. I think we, we can really focus on that and make the best out of it. And uh, I had a lot of these things going on sometimes when I felt like, which is maybe also a mistake because maybe I didn't have my team develop as much and went through that pain. But for example, in the spring split, I felt like we we actually went like seven and two in the first half with Igna and Memento. Um, and then we lost like every game and I... Yep really started losing a little bit of uh, faith in my teammates to be like reliable and I I think we really went down a bad downward spiral because Abedaga now like he won LCS for example and I think he's really solid and also in the later years in the Miracle Run for example. This was his first split though, this is yeah. he was a rookie. It, yeah. it was literally his first split yes. and I think he was really struggling with confidence a lot and um, we we also had Memento, who was not really a uh, very reliable player, in my opinion. Um, I think he brought like good positives, but that also gave us a lot of wins in the start. But this was also really a big thing later on that cost us a lot of games. And he also was struggling mentally a lot with that. And I think at the time I was probably not mature enough. Uh, and I was maybe thinking myself, like I was maybe feeling a little bit too sorry for myself and was too focused on myself instead of being the leader that my team needed and really building good 
relationships with my teammates and trying to give them like more confidence or make them feel like more at home and in that time. And I think a lot of people that play with me that feel that are struggling, I think have often like some judgment on me because I am a very confident person myself and I really say what I want and I criticize people and I try to do it in a good way of course but I think people that are like feeling insecure more about themselves have big problems with I can have problems with my personality and it can make them feel worse about themselves because they feel not intimidated but maybe you understand what I'm saying I mean it just feels awkward if someone calls you out sometimes right I mean this is even a topic we could get into if you want because that's one thing I think is actually not misunderstood by a lot of fans you know fans see interviews and they go well every player wants to win of course his goal is the championship but I always tell people but for most people when they say they want to win they mean that like a fantasy dream that's like me saying if I'm in an office thinking of being on a beach with a margarita on a fucking hammock I'm just dreaming of what it would be nice you know I'm not really going to do what I to do i'm just in a bloody office so i have i always say to people like one of the reasons why some of the really competitive players get a bad reputation as teammates is because there are a lot of players who at the end of the day it is playing a game some people just think it's fun some people just think i'm already good or they don't you know some people just don't have a crazy killer instinct to want to be the best ever they just want to be good like now and you know some people it's more like let's try our hand if it works out cool we won the game if we didn't get them next time like that doesn't seem like that would vibe with you mate no, it's I, the biggest problem in my career with teammates I have is if the agenda, like the most important thing in them is not that they really want to win in the end. And I can sense that a lot and I can see how people are in practice and I can see how they play solo queue. And it's definitely something I need to work on myself to not, I mean, I have been working for a long time on that to not make them feel bad for it because in the end, it doesn't really help me winning to make other people not <laughs> feel like not good enough for or not, not 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 good enough, but make them feel bad about it when this is like their limitations and they are like that and their personality are like that and they need different things. And I really want it so badly, and it can like make other people feel like stressed out maybe or or not so good around me and in the end that doesn't help anyone i want to win and i make my teammates play worse maybe uh, so i've worked a lot on trying to help other people more uh in the in my desire to win i need to make sure that other people can do their best as well in the team that i'm in and that's like has been i think since 2018 i think 2018 i was the and the year before that for sure i was more immature in 2018 i was not in a leading position much even though the game was played around me mostly and i did really well and i was the all pro id that split and i look fondly on that split but um after 2019 it was like my team and yeah i didn't go where i wanted to go but that's just competition i signed a contract it's like what now i have to do what i have to uh, i'm supposed to do and i took much more responsibility uh every year playing after that in terms of trying to help people out and especially after that spring split i felt i i honestly felt like i didn't have a bad game that split and i felt i was really fucking good and i got rank one like two accounts rank one and i felt so ready but i could see the problems in my team and then we changed my went out for trick because i felt like i still could learn a lot in that regard and some someone who also has really the like people can say what they want about trick and that he maybe wasn't the greatest individual player at times or that he fell a little bit off after his two mvp splits or that he like didn't seem like like a superstar player all the time or anything or that he didn't win so much internationally but he still what i really admire about him he i think he was probably like the only player that i saw like nearly for a whole split sit down with somebody after or before scrim and actually watch reviews and like try to teach and watch the games of the scrims while still playing solo queue. You know, I said how a lot of the people who played with Nuke Doc, it's a similar scenario also, like all praise him super duper. I heard a similar thing about Trick basically, that people said like he's really good at like teaching things about the game and how to play and like, and that even though like, because people wouldn't expect it because they think because he's Korean, he wouldn't have great English. He is perfectly fine English. Like it seems like everyone says this quality though, like he's kind of someone who like leveled their game up. Like we're not talking by the way about like basics. We're obviously talking about like macro concepts and stuff and how to work with the jungler, right? 
No, it, it was awesome. And actually, this 2019 summer split, uh, I always had, like, the first two years, I had, like, not good split. Actually, the first three years, also in Challenger Series, I had, like, not so good results. And then we made a change, and then we got a really good result. And both the 2018 summer splits, where we went top two, and then the 2019 summer, where we went top three, I have really good memories about, like, what even though we didn't win the split i felt like we we had a lot of the things that i could imagine a winning team ne needing and trick was definitely a good, big part of that and again we played the game very much around bot lane and i think this is also the year where i started to like get a lot more lane advantages and really cement myself much more in the laning phase and uh yeah i was playing super well i think trick helped abadag so much and even odo um, and yeah, I I was kind of proud of what we achieved because even though we didn't win, I still think we were like clearly the third best team in this split for nearly all of it. And it was because we found what was working for us and I was having actually a really great split. And Igna, I think, gets kind of a bad rap. Um, but I think you need to know how you can get the best out of him because I really think he's super talented and he's really good in lane but he is also a very emotional player i think and he can close himself off a little bit if he doesn't feel like he's being seen by his teammates or by what he also needs from his team and with trick he was like a very mature i think and was really trying to improve the team too so i felt me trick and igna could really help our team reach uh, the best and of course the split ended with us getting <laughs> three out uh, against Fnatic by like getting invaded level one like three games in a row or two games and losing like buff and dying. And it was funny because in the weeks before that, if there's only three teams left, you can only scrim. And we had of like, course, yes, we were stomping Fnatic and scrims like so hard. And it's so you we thought were, you were going to the final end, presumably, right? Yeah, of course. We were like 20 and 3 or something crazy, or 20 and 2. They barely could win. Oh, also, I wanted to mention that Dylan was my coach in the split. Yes. And, and he he's really good at creating like structure and focus on what makes the team win. Uh, I think at the time he was not very, he was very agreeable, I think, uh, when he was the coach in this team. And I felt like he was lacking more of the also setting boundaries with people yeah, yeah. I, I think i <laughs> maybe also can be annoying to some of my teammates i really like to try to set certain boundaries for how we practice and what champs we should be playing the champs we're actually going to play on stage and not have too much fun uh with like or not not I want it to be structured. I want people to really think, like, what am I going to play if this is bent? What am I going to play after that? If he picks that, what am I going to play? That's how I always think about the champs I want to play and the bot lane match, uh, matchups I want to play with Silly. And um, I think it goes a lot of into that. And I don't like when people show up, like, very unprepared and just, like, yeah, just winging scrims. And I just want to play this champ because it's really fun right now. And I just lock it in. Uh, especially if I think the player is like not very top class and didn't reach his like I feel like they're holding themselves back in a way when they are not as good as they could be but maybe that's just my way of thinking and maybe this is like exactly what they need but uh, that was always the same thing was like I want winning to be the most important thing and for that I think people need to be really logical or uh, disciplined in their approach to practice and um I think Dylan was also uh, good at finding the champs. Sometimes he was more lenient than me, maybe, <laughs> with how I think what people should play. But um, yeah, he was a really mature coach, I think, for, for my, in my career. And I To me, this he, is... Oh, sorry, go on. And I think he, I heard also that he improved quite a lot after in the Schalke teams where they, for example, made the Miracle Run. I think he developed a more, not dark side, but a more... You've got to be a bit ruthless sometimes. You are yeah. the boss at the end of the day, aren't you? You're not their friend. You are the boss. Yeah, you know? exactly. And I, I think you could also see in G2 now, like, they started so early with practicing. They found what worked for them really well in these playoffs, and then they just stuck with it so disciplined. And how they play is, like, so structured from my point of view. And then it also has rooms for individuals to really shine. So 
I think he's a very underrated coach from my... To me, though, this is also why, like, the tough part about your career is that you go, you went up and then you had this step down where you had to go for a couple of years before you got the chance in an elite team again. Because mm -hmm. to me, the things you're describing, unfortunately, are also just part of the nature of being in a lower level team, I'm afraid. Because when you're in those teams, like I say, the players you get are people who've been kicked out or they haven't yet made it or they're young in their career or they're too washed up. And unfortunately, those people aren't going to be on the same page as you. So the difference is in a team like that or any of those lower teams, it's almost like you're trying to change the entire culture of the team and change people's total mindset and vision of the game. Meanwhile, if you're in a team like G2 or Fnatic, like the big, big orgs, people aren't even supposed to be there if they're not here to win. They're supposed to be there to be the best at their role. And, and if you're not, by the way, the org's supposed to replace you. It's not like you even have to do it yourself. So it sounds like to me, this is also some of the struggles of being a big fish in a small pond, as we say in English. Um, yeah, but yeah, definitely. And I'm not sure... If I will ever find a group where I feel like everyone feels the same way as me, that's probably, with my experience, naive to think about at this point that I will meet, that everyone thinks the same way as me at the right time and wants to do exactly the same thing as me. It's probably never going to happen, but the theme of my career, I feel like, is definitely taking a step forward, taking two steps forward and then taking one step back. And there has been a lot of uh, setbacks and difficult moments for me that um, have given me a lot of strength and uh, experience that I hopefully will use well to prepare myself forward even after losing again. <laughs> Plus, to me, part of the issue will obviously will at some point in time now bring up the whole like reckless forgiven slash reckless upset slash contrast that everyone loves to do. But one of the ways I wanted to set it up was like this as well. So obviously at this period in time, you had a worse team than reckless. Not really a shock there. I think people can look at the rosters and see that and he was winning the MVP, etc. But I think another part of it that makes it tougher to compare you and reckless at this time compared to the old discussion like four years earlier of like reckless against forgiven is reckless against forgiven was in the era when you could just stay in the bottle in. Like, if anyone goes and loads up a classic Forgiven demo, like, spoiler, he's just going to have them pushed up in his lane the whole fucking time until he's ganked. That's all he's going to do. He's going to take the tower. He's going to have them under the tower. That's all he's going to be doing for, like, 20 minutes. And, spoiler, that's all he wanted to do. To him, that was, like, a win. It's The joke is, he didn't care if you win the game. He won. The lane was the game to him. He wanted to prove that he was pushed in. He's got your head, and no matter what the matchup is, that's also the logic, right? Which is why, if people don't know, there was that whole weird thing where he would almost, like, he was almost proud of the fact he never had jungle help and he won to be 2v3 which is like pfft. but anyway you get the point right but here's the issue that's brilliant if you're in a smaller team like he was when he was in bad teams at Copenhagen Wolves or less skilled teams because you can at least hard play through that guy in your era the eras we're talking about we're talking like season 8 onwards this is already when the like the best teams in the world the support roams all the time in fact the support's job at that point became like mini jungler wasn't it his job was like gank mid with the fucking jungler so at this point in time like what I wondered about is one it must be a lot harder in this era to actually be like a hard carry ADC and just win if your team's not as good compared to some of the forgiven lineups and then second it must be a lot trickier to navigate that because on the one hand the more you let the support roam sometimes it might mean that you're not getting as fed yourself but at the same time you have to do it some time because that's how your coach is going to coach the game that's what the meta game is in fact the logic back then if people don't know was like the jungler's job is like unlock the support the support is unlocked he goes unlocks the middler and that's like how the whole map was played so it sounds like if you want to be like a hard carry ADC and you're in a team where maybe you even could say like give me all the resources it's, it's going to be harder to carry though right it must be tricky and I know from the outside a fan's not going to see all that they're just going to think that every team's the same and each player is positioned you know let's look at the damage stats and stuff what would you say to that it must be tricky yeah i mean i <laughs> contrary to maybe not popular belief but to some things that uh, i see more repeated about me is that i really have to be that guy on my team and i really don't feel like i have to be that guy but often i start to reach the conclusion that it I should do that for my team just because I see how people talk with each other after scrims. Is this guy like real? Does he really want it? Does he really want to go to his jungle and say like, "Here, look in the review. Uh, here, I think this was a good timing for me." And then he says, "No, it was not a good timing. I have to do this." And then, "No, but yeah, okay. Then you can do this. But then maybe at this point we can do this together. And then we, after we do this, we can move here. And if this happens, can you do this?" And I don't see that so much in my teams. Or at least in some of the teams, I don't want to be uh, overgeneralized, but I think if you don't do that work, that you are like really on the same page with the guys 
like mid lane has to probably do the most because support jungle and mid in a perfect world they're like constantly talking after the yes. game like sure. how because they have the most responsibility because jungle and support are the people that can impact the game the most because they can leave their lane the most in early game and early game is like super influential right now i'm pretty sure like the teams that has had at 15 wins like i mean even with all the comebacks has played probably like 75% of games which obviously like if your team wins 75% of games it's like you you're basically the number one team uh, so the game is played so much around that and mid is obviously the lane that can go to either side you could see caps he was ahead on mid my top laner was getting dove on the next uh, moment he had he was already bot securing drake and the next moment he was invading jungle i mean Marek, of course, does the same when he's ahead uh, mid lane. Humanoid, that is, yes. Just yeah, you don't know his name. Yeah. yeah, yeah, humanoid. So mid is like the most influential role to carry because he has he's strong at every point in the game, usually, unless you play like certain champs. And mid and support, uh, jungle and support should be there because it's the easiest to impact the whole map. It's a short lane, yeah, exactly. The most control, yeah. And yeah. if you play more bot lane, usually your top laner gets into a situation where he has to more fend for himself. Of course, it's not like the jungle can never go top, but usually you try to play like mid mid bot lane more. But if you go bot first and you set up a lot to like try to kill the enemy, it can work. And if you have like good draft or good matchups where you can really push it, you can really snowball games. And I mean, in my career, I've carried countless games like this. But to get back to an initial point, I really want to feel from my teammates that they want the resources to carry the game and know what to do with them and not just like, ah, I just gank mid Lamau. Uh, I want to carry, just gank mid. It's not that simple. And I I think in some of the teams, uh, so, so for some it's also just personality. They are just not that engaged with other people and they don't like to have conflict as much. Sure. And they, they more want people to do it for them or you need a good pairing of like two people that really want to work together or preferably three people right that really want to make the best out of the situation and i think that builds that needs time to build like a trusting relationship where you can give criticism in a good way and the other person receives it and you also need to give the other person the benefit of the doubt and i've always tried hard i think to do that with my support and my jungles even though some people think i maybe treat my jungles bad or my support uh, and there's definitely moments where i'm mad but it's always with the intention same way they are also mad of course it's always with the intention to get better together and to work it out and i really don't like when there's issues and they're not this is the other thing i hate when there's issues and they're not addressed and we are not working on it and it's because it's more comfortable to just do nothing or to just, yeah, just let it play out. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's not me. I rather make a change or try to change the situation. I don't like to do nothing. Um, the funny thing is, though, when people use that framing, because you are right, essentially they've taken that original narrative of like, this guy might be a bit like forgiven and they're like, he just is forgiven. Like, the f all right, because famously he obviously did want every all the fucking game played through him, and he thought all his teammates were like Loki, secretly shit, even if they were like all oh, pro, pro, etc. Like I've told people the story before. The moment I actually had to just be like out on Forgiven was when he actually thought that like season six H two K were all shit. And I was like, bro, these are the best players. Like, look, I get it, you don't have like the god mid laner, but like fucking hell, but you got Yang Cos, Vander, Odo, I mean. So anyway, some people are just beyond help. But here's the question I have, right? The reason I find that crazy, dude, is because a lot of people don't know this because I because people. It, Here's a quick primer on how journalism right, works, right? If you're known as someone who reveals things that are, like, secret and can change the scene, you don't even have to then go and find the information, mate. It comes to you. People bring the information to you, like Game of Thrones, like Varys or something. The info just comes to you. Now, your job then, it's true, is you have to sort out who's talking shit and who just wants you to say something that isn't true or has some agenda or whatever. So one of the things I happen to know from loads of Reckless's teammates is the joke is it's the other way around, mate. Reckless fans would tell you he's the one who's the selfless one. He's the one who's no mate he's the one who wants to be played through all the time all the, dude he's the guy who has Hillisang and doesn't want Hillisang to roam like he just wants to be the star but the joke is if you look at a lot of his teams like I said he tends to win the MVP when he's the star but if you look at his teams that did the best it's usually when he has like the god tier mid laner when he has the best solo lanes like actually I got this uh, vibe from you that actually this period in the interview is perfect to give this example to me the move after Schalke shows that isn't upsets mentality right here's the difference Think about this. 
this. Reckless played his whole career in the best teams in Europe. He always had the solo learners, dude. That means, actually, sometimes when he wanted to play through himself, I think that was being a bit selfish. He's like, dude, you've got Spec and so on. It's like, slow your roll, mate. They're pretty good. Here's the difference. You were on a lot of teams like the Schalke team. Where it's like you are the star. So my question is this. To me, when you went to OG, that proved that you didn't just only want to play through you. Because when you join OG, you are joining two of the best solo laners in Europe historically. And they're both people who are considered like selfish solo laners. Like, everyone knows fucking Nuke Duck's going to be getting that side wave lane. Everyone knows Alfari's going for the 15 CS in lane every fucking game. Like, if you join a team like that as an ADC and you're the younger player, in theory, you're not joining to just be like, everyone do what I say. Like, you, what I get the vibe upset is it's the other way around. You've had too many times in your career where you didn't have the help from the solo lanes that you just had to learn how to be really good at playing without it. But I'm sure your dream, like the little team you've got now, I'm sure your dream was to just have the best solo laners, right? Just have the best squad. Not have to just be all me all the time. My dream is just to win the split, <laughs> really. Uh, so having the best team will obviously help me so fucking much to get closer to that. So yeah, definitely. I just want to be in the best team. And if I carry the game alone and I'm the MVP, I, I'm not going to say I wouldn't enjoy that. Of course. And I wouldn't be fucking happy to say I'm the best player. And because I, I feel that way. I feel I'm the best in my role. I felt that way. Even when I was 10th place, I felt I'm still the best and I will feel that way probably if I end my career and I never want anything, I will still think to myself, ah, fuck, I, I'm, this road was not meant to be for me this way. Uh, but it, that's life and I learned from it and I did my best and that's what I, how I feel about myself and I can look at the games, how I played them and think, yeah, you, with everything I consider in the game, I think I did very, very well and um yeah the origin lineup i mean europe is sometimes like a little bit sad because if there wasn't like some budget problems i mean this is also a thing i've always pri prioritized my team over my own salary or anything and i've always spent basically every or nearly every off season as in how good the lineup is you will go for a better lineup over less salary fee it, it, oh, yeah. and maybe take less salary to get a better lineup I mean, right? since season eight right. of course every off season i had na offers uh not comparable to the salary eu teams pay usually i I'm sure it's way higher right like three yeah, times of higher course. Or yeah something like that and for example to join this origin lineup because i really wanted to play with um, I mean, I basically had offers from nearly every team except uh, Fnatic G2, I'm and G2 at the time. Uh, but I, this team, I saw how they missed the playoffs, actually, the the summer split, but in spring they were in the final. Yes. And I really thought Alfari and Nu and also Mithy are players I want to play with so badly, but in the end it ended up not being possible to get Mithy in the team for budget reasons. Because, I mean, the money is just not something that is just there. And I heard that one was ridiculous, though, dude. I heard it wasn't even just like, I heard like they offered him like fucking an incredibly low salary that would be considered like insulting for someone of his status. Is that accurate? Yeah. And everyone on the team already took pay cuts. Like yes, me, exactly. Alfari, yes. Nuke. I'm pretty sure even Gelotto took pay cuts. And Zersa also got less than he could have gotten, of course. Um, so, yeah. We all made sacrifices to try to make this team, but in the end, I couldn't get the support. And uh, I think Alfari is definitely... Like, if I break down the personalities in this team, I also want to say about Nuke, I didn't say it in the Schalke one. Uh, and maybe I can also speak about Chachi a little yeah. bit with that. Both of these set of solo lanes, I mean, Chachi, I think, is the opposite of Alfari, that he doesn't want this jungle to play around top but if he's there he knows what he wants to do with him and that he is a, such a selfless player he really embraces the tanks and he finds such good ways to make a big impact on that and he i think he's probably the only player i never had an argument with my whole career because he's just so mature and we always found ways to talk about things that we each other can do better in a very good way and i really admire him for that maturity that he brought to the table how he treated his teammates how he like he i wouldn't say he was the leader in the team uh, at all but he brought some kind of leadership just through his emotional support i think to the table and that people can trust him 
which is really important, of course. Um, but he was also not the guy that said, I want the game to be around top. And Nuke is not necessarily the guy that will sit down and say, I want you to be here and I want you to do this. He helps with macro, of course, but he's not the guy that has the mental energy, I think, to just push for what he wants. Even if there's, he meets a lot of resistance from his jungle to like, and he's the jungle is saying like stupid shit to him, and he's like, ah, I can't do this because of this, and it's like an excuse because something went wrong in the game. He is not the guy that will just no, you have to do this here, and he will not say like in game like, hey, you have to come here. He lacks some urgency, I think, in being that guy. And I think if you ha you really would like to have that guy in your team in mid lane as well. Yeah, yeah. Like a decisive. Perk. Yeah. Like a perks, like a caps. And I think this is like a big difference maker, but also the teams they had were a big difference maker. Sure. But I, I can see that caps is that guy. I can see that perks is that guy. And Nuke was more like he wants his team to play good and he wants to just do his part well, but he was not the guy that forced or not that put like a lot of pressure on this has to work and we have to do it and keep working at it. He was more the guy that gets drained and gives up and gives up that these people are not the uh, best at, at what they do and that it just that the circumstance is just not working and um to protect himself of course because yeah i always got the vibe by the way he had a similar situation here he was in some teams that were scoffed but the difference is here's the difference in reaction you were still trying to sort of like win people over or tell them we've got to do it this way whereas i got the vibe he was just like right i'll just play mid lane then you guys do whatever i just play mid lane that's me yeah but i think it also speaks to it's very tough to think you're the best and always not reach what you want and if sure. you look at nuke's career he probably had it even worse than me because yes. he was literally like the best player probably or like one of the best players in europe for sure season three maybe the best mid with Xpeke. i don't remember like entirely frogging was there too of course so one but one of the top players yeah yeah of course. i think that's fair and he Absolutely. made it worse like once in season three and ever since then he was like in struggling teams trying to get nip out of challenger series having a really shit time in rocket having like these fucking vitality lineups where it's like, what are we even doing here? Why is there, I mean. There's some I, really uh, weird teams if you go back why, and look at those lineups. Yeah. Why, why the nationality in the team seems to make oh, a <laughs> priority on who, what players are being picked up and then some uh, tyranny with uh, some Korean imports that also impacted the team hard. Like it basically took like six seasons for him till season eight. And he was not the player that gives up to be like, ah, okay, I'm going to slack, fuck this, I'm just going to play other games. He was still fucking grinding and doing his best in solo queue, but he was not the guy that's like, I'm going to try to change people and have like a leadership impact on them, uh, which he did more in season eight, I think, which is something, I think because he felt empowered by the team, because we said like, dude, you know how to play this meta really well let's we chip into what you want we try to listen to you and if people are not listening we will like bark at them like hey listen to this guy we want to do it this way and everyone had more this uh, accountability mindset in our team with amazing he also uh, for him accountability is very important and he sometimes goes a little bit crazy as a, he's definitely someone who loves to argue i can't the strike keyword loves like he doesn't just do it because it's a problem he, he likes to just go back and forth and test the ideas etc yeah, so you can really believe it, etc. He, you know. he goes far, I think. I but I think he has a good heart, but sometimes yeah, yeah. It just goes very overboard. It's also something I don't want to become myself, where it seems like I always want to talk about problems and I want to everything urgency. We have to do this now, and it's like I don't. I you need to be. Sometimes I think he lacked a little bit of self awareness of like how urgent the situation needed to be, but sometimes it was also necessary. So. It's definitely not a black and white character. Um, but yeah, uh, this is what I miss in Nuke. I think this is what maybe cost him some some success that he could have had. The, but in the end, are people really capable of doing so much more than what I think they should be doing? Uh, or maybe people are really also at their limit and the way they are is because they are this way and maybe you can't change people that much uh, i'm still not entirely sure i think definitely if i was a better leader i could have done more but i think i still need some time to gain that maturity and to 
build more trusting relationships with the people that I want to have a positive impact on. Uh, and I think that's what I missed in Nuke a little bit. And in Origin, I think he, in that season, I think in spring he was still good and he really tried to make it work. But I think he had a lot of health problems in terms of sleep. And Nuke is somebody who really needs to sleep. And he, I think he had problems with allergies, but also his sleep was really horrible. So I think he was, uh, in that split, he was more a shell of himself. And I think he had a resurgence now in Excel more. But I, I also think all the splits probably were really draining for him. This video was kindly supported by Ahmed Hadju, Matt Pugnacio Ragula, Travis Goff, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Butt Pounder 420, Hades, Jensen Gore, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Tukan, William Peyton Lacey, Zumba, Xyrathenia, and a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Want to suggest a topic or a guest? Want to ask a question in my monthly AMA? I promise they're coming. Want teasers for my upcoming content? Would you like to be in one of those lengthy donated discussions with me? Well, if any of the above tickles your fancy or the other perks available, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today where in the description box below.